a blue check mark on Twitter used to be a way for users to verify the authenticity of an account. But recently, CEO Elon Musk said people must pay $8 a month for the platform's, quote, Twitter blue subscription service. As a result, journalists, politicians, celebrities, city and government organizations who would not pay have been stripped of their verified status, causing chaos and confusion about what information can be trusted. I'm joined now by Juliette Kayem. She's professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and former assistant secretary at the Department of Homeland Security. Juliet, it's good to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So to get a blue check previously, yeah. there was a process. You had to have your identity verified, like many journalists, I had right. one as well. What are the real world implications of that verification process going away? Right. So verification was part of an overall process that Twitter had that made it the most reliable platform, in, especially in times of emergency or disaster, which is the world that I come from, disaster management. Right. And what it did is it ensured that the way the algorithm worked is that when something bad happened, uh, journalists, government officials, emergency managers, their information what they were seeing, what they were hearing, and most importantly, what did they want community members to do? Do you run? Do you hide? Do you evacuate? Do you shelter in place? Those are important decisions to be made with just a few moments notice. All of those were now valid, were validated through the blue check mark. Now, just you know, based on experience, but because we know the blue check mark is unreliable, uh, Twitter feeds, just think of a school shooting, Twitter feeds are just unreliable, they're not helpful, they're not giving you information in real time. So that has been a I, I, used, I said, Twitter used to be good at saving lives. I know it's hard for people to believe, but it really became a way in which public safety agencies were pushing out information. Mm -hmm. And as importantly, it became a way in which communities and information was being heard by government officials. That's a system with, that's called API. But basically, in a, let's say the earthquake in Turkey, yeah government officials would follow what was happening on Twitter. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who seem to be, you know, uh, under rubble here. There's a lot of people who seem to be without water here. And that would help drive resources. That whole system is now unreliable, uh, not accessible. Uh, and so I know we talk a lot about what's bad about Twitter, but at one stage it was really good. It yeah. was really, really good. There is the emergency and disaster response part of yeah. it. There's also the misinformation yes. part of it. What are sort of the, the worst case consequences you're seeing? Here? Well, we saw, we saw it on day one when the blue check mark uh, could be bought. Uh, someone clever, not it didn't seem like he was nefarious, bought the National Weather Service uh, uh, name. Yeah. So that if you were looking for the National Weather Service, which is the, the sort of you know best assessor of what weather is telling us, yeah. and then it's pushing out information based on where you are regionally or locally, uh, uh, someone bought the check mark so that if you went to National Weather uh, Service, you might be watching that. Now we're seeing it in terms of New York, like, for example, New York City Services, uh, emergency management um, entities. And These are fake accounts, basically, fake accounts that paid that are, for right. a check mark, and it's, right? It, and, and I, you know, in a disaster, time is really your most valued commodity. Yeah. And Twitter was really good at sort of pushing out information yeah. in real time, very quickly, very reliably. reliably. And there's, and they liked it. I mean, that's the interesting thing. If you go back to the company, and I've worked with the company over years, uh, they, uh, they really thought that this was a role that was important to them as mm -hmm. a company, uh, and then that's all been abandoned. What about Elon Musk's approach yeah. to journalists yes. and to journalism writ large? For folks who haven't been tracking this, we should yeah. also say, in the interest of full disclosure, our PBS NewsHour account still does tweet out yes. our reporting and information. But Musk had stripped the New York Times of their verified status. He tweeted um, that the real tragedy of the New York Times is their propaganda isn't yeah. even interesting. That's to his 137 million followers. He's also suspended accounts of journalists yeah. who follow him. He added a state-affiliated yeah. media label NPR. to NPR's yeah. account. I mean, what, what message does that send? So he's basically trolling journalists because the journalists are critical of him or just the reporting is critical of him. And he seems to now view Twitter as sort of his own um, sort of hit list, I guess I would say, that he's using it as a way to make it impossible for legitimate journalists, for legitimate in institutions to get out information legitimate information in real time. Um, you know, will he stop doing that? One hopes. I, I always think that he's just going to, he seems like someone who will get bored with this and then move on to the next thing. But there's legitimate damage being done, one, because it, it misrepresents some journalists and what they're doing and may elevate 
other journalists. There's, you know, people who should not, for example, be called journalists. Yeah. Uh, and also, it undermines the legitimacy of organizations like PBS or NPR. I need to ask you in the minute or so yeah. we have left about a story we reported on yes. earlier, the revelations around Jack yeah. Teixeira, that Massachusetts Air National Guardsman accused of leaking those intelligence documents in a previous role. Yeah. You oversaw the Massachusetts Air National Guard. <laughs> and I just wonder how yeah. you are taking all of this in about how yeah. someone like that got a security clearance. It, it, it seems inconceivable until I tell you that 1.3 million people have top secret clearance. It's just, it's too many people at this stage. And it's a public and private, it's, it's national, federal, state. It's, it's lots of people have access to classified information. And it seems where the gap was, or there were two gaps here. Mm -hmm. One was he was doing all sorts of things when he was 16 and 17 years old. Not not good things at all, mm -hmm. with racism, made threatening people. Uh, and somehow the Pentagon cleared him, sort of excused it as sort of youthful transgressions and we're going we're gonna to let him in. But once they do that, they then give him access to everything. And I think that the question now is it, it's inconceivable to me that he had access to everything that he was then able to release. So there's the question of how did he get it in the first place? Why did he have access for this particular job? And then the, the question that the Pentagon is going to have to answer over months, he is putting this stuff online, and no one at the Pentagon captures it. He's putting it on gaming platforms for months. So a lot of questions. A lot of questions. Uh, Julia Kayem, professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me.